a central Paris railway station at the height of rush hour. Thousands of passengers head home. Suddenly, a runaway train hurtles towards the station. Three hundred seven tons of crashing metal slams into a packed commuter train. Fifty-six people die in Paris's worst train crash. Now, using advanced computer simulations, we reveal exactly what led to disaster at the Gare de Lyon. Disasters don't just happen. They're triggered by a chain of critical events. Unravel the clues and count down those final seconds from disaster. Europe. France. Paris. June 27th, 1988. A summer evening in the French capital. Paris is the focal point of the French rail network. The French are proud of their rail system. It's one of the biggest in Europe, with 34,000 miles of track. With state funding and an ongoing modernization program since the early 80s, the system is high-tech and efficient. 6.20 p.m. The 538 inbound commuter service from Elon to Paris's Gare de Lyon station is running on time. The 80-mile journey takes 75 minutes. It's an eight-carriage train, and in the driver's seat is 42-year-old Daniel Solen. He's worked for SNCF, the French National Railway, since he was 15. Jean Bovy is the guard on the train. He's another old hand who joined the SNCF straight out of school. So far, it's been a routine trip. But at 6.36 p.m., five miles outside Paris, the train passes through Vert de Maison station, and something unexpected happens. A young woman in the second carriage leaps up and pulls the emergency cord. A bell in Solen's cab alerts him that someone has pulled the cord, and the brakes are automatically activated. The woman slips from the train and disappears. Before the train can get moving again, Solen needs to reset the alarm and rearm the brakes. It's an all too familiar procedure. It should only take a few minutes, but Solen still radios the control room to alert them of the holdup. 6.40 p.m. Most of the passengers, fearing a long delay, leave the train to find another way to complete their journey. The remaining few resign themselves to a late arrival in Paris. Solène and Bovy try to rearm the brake system so the train can continue its journey to the Gare de Lyon station. Gare de Lyon rail station serves the south and east of the country. Behind its magnificent 19th century exterior lies one of Europe's most sophisticated rail hubs. It's one of France's busiest stations. With a mixture of intercity service and commuter trains serving the suburbs. The nerve center coordinating all train movements is the station's control room. Duty manager tonight is Andre Tolens. He's in charge of safety and ensuring that the 360 trains going in and out of the station run smoothly. Always at the back of his mind is the threat of terrorism. For the past seven years, Arab militant groups have been targeting Paris. They're protesting French troops in war-torn Lebanon and demanding the release of Arab prisoners. Many of the attacks have been on trains in and out of the city. 6.45 p.m. Hurrying towards Gare de Lyon station to catch a train home is commercial assistant Colette Pacalet. She was late leaving the office and worries she'll miss the train. Colette is a recently divorced single mother 
and she's anxious to get back to her son, 13-year-old Nicholas. When I'm working, I automatically hurry back to take care of my son. I fix him something to eat and help him with his homework. Forty-year-old Dominique Pavi, who works at the Louvre Art Gallery, also rushes to catch the same train. Like thousands of others, she's still grappling with a summer timetable. With new train times and altered routes, it's a recipe for confusion and missed trains. 7.02 p.m. Solène has fixed the brakes, and the train is ready to depart again for Paris. But it's taken him much longer than expected. The train is now 26 minutes behind schedule. Controller Tolance instructs Solène to skip the next scheduled stop, Maison Alfort, and travel nonstop to Gare de Lyon to make up time. But Solène's late train isn't Tolance's only headache. 704. Now there's a problem on one of the commuter trains due to leave Gare de Lyon. It's the train that Colette and Dominique are rushing to catch. Commuter trains have a driver and a guard. Driver André Tongui is ready to go, but the guard is running late. Without him, the train can't leave. It's good news for single mother Colette Pacalet. She's relieved the train hasn't left. She even manages to secure her usual seat in the front carriage. The delay means more people pile onto the train. Another late arrival is Dominique Pavi. The train was packed. It was hot because it was summer. Being underground, it was hot and sticky. All the passengers and their driver Tongui can do is sit and wait for the guard to arrive. Their outbound train is on platform two, the same platform that the late running inbound service from Milan is due to use. But they don't need to worry. Signalers have pre-programmed a set of points to prevent Solène's train from going into platform two. Half a mile before it reaches the station, the points will automatically switch, sending the train into empty platform one instead. 7.07 p.m. Solène's inbound train is now traveling at more than 60 miles per hour. A yellow signal warns him to start slowing down. Just ahead is a steep grade leading into Gare de Lyon station. But when he applies the brakes, there is hardly a response. To his horror, Solène realizes that his brakes aren't working. He can't slow his train down. The 300-ton train is hurtling out of control, and it's less than a mile and a half to the packed rush hour station. A runaway train with defective brakes races towards Paris's Gare de Lyon. It's rush hour, and the station is packed with commuters, including those waiting on a delayed outbound train. Daniel Solène, the driver, is getting desperate. He knows there should be a handbrake somewhere on the train. Guard Jean Bovy hurries to look for it. We asked ourselves what was happening to us. We tried the brakes, but there was no response. So I decided to go down the train to look for handbrakes. Solène keeps trying the brakes. It slows the train, but not enough. 7.07 and 30 seconds. Solène radios a desperate warning to the control room. Stop everything, I've got no brakes. Stop everything, I've got no brakes. Panicking, Solène hits the train's radio alarm signal. It can't be heard by passengers who are still unaware of the danger but it activates a high-pitched audio alarm in the Gare de Lyon control room and the driver cabs of all the commuter trains within the vicinity. Immediately, signal men turn every green light red. Drivers stop their trains wherever they are. 
Within seconds, the entire network grinds to a halt, with the exception of one train. Unable to do more from his cab, Solen rushes the remaining passengers to the rear of the train. At Gare de Lyon, the guard on the delayed outbound train has finally shown up. But now driver Andre Tongi's signal switches to red. He has no idea what's going on, and the high-pitched whistle on his radio means he can't use it to find out. Seven o eight p.m. The runaway train hits the beginning of the steep four-degree grade that leads into the station. It picks up speed on the sharp descent. Driver Solen manages to get all the passengers into the last carriage. They brace themselves for the inevitable impact. There was panic, a lot of panic. Train guard Bovi is still desperately searching for a handbrake. I asked myself, what was going to happen to me? Was this going to be my last moment? Seven o eight p.m. and fifteen seconds. At Gare de Lyon station, Andre Tanguy is still not sure why he is stuck on a red light. In the second carriage, passenger Dominique Pavi has had enough with the wait. It was difficult to get off the train because there were so many people. Pardon, pardon. Dominique has to squeeze past other passengers to get to the exit. 7.08 and 30 seconds. Signal operators see the runaway train rushing past them. Instead of being routed to empty platform one as planned, it's heading straight for Tongi's packed commuter train. The signalmen immediately issue a warning over the station's public address system to evacuate the train. Attention, attention. Andre Tongi hears it. He shouts over the train's intercom to evacuate. Passengers scramble to reach the doors. 708 and 45 seconds. Tongi sees the runaway train heading straight for him, but he knows his train must still be packed with people trying to get off. Instead of jumping, he bravely stays on the intercom, repeating his warning to passengers. Seconds later, 307 tons of runaway train smash into the commuter train on platform two. Dominique Pavi leaves the train just in time. She feels the impact of the massive collision just yards behind her. There was a great black dust cloud, a horrific cloud that was suspended around the train. I could hardly see anything. The dust fell pretty quickly, and it was then that I realized that one train had run into another, and the train that came down from the tunnel had split the first carriage of my train completely in two. On the runaway train, all the passengers are in the rear car. Most escape without serious injury. At the moment of impact, I was walking into the last carriage. I heard a great noise and felt a small shock. I didn't even fall over. I just grabbed a railing. But those on Tongi stationary train don't fare so well. Tongi doesn't stand a chance. The impact kills him instantly. Single mother Colette Pacalet is in the front carriage, which suffers the full impact of the crash. At first, I thought it could be a bomb. I don't remember how long it lasted. 10 seconds, 20 seconds, I have no idea. I had just enough time to think, oh, I'm going to die, Papa, help me. 
Just seconds ago, Colette was looking forward to spending the evening with her young son. Now she lies trapped in the wreckage with dozens of other severely injured passengers. If she doesn't receive medical attention soon, she may not survive. A runaway train crashes into a packed commuter train at Paris's Gare de Lyon. A photojournalist captures the full horror of the collision just seconds later. A scene of total devastation confronts Jean Bovy, the guard on the runaway train. I still see images, a kind of burning smell, and then people crushed in the carriage. I can still see all that, and just after the impact, the start of the groans. I just wanted to run away. Seven twenty p.m. Eleven minutes after the disaster. The first rescue workers arrive at the Gare de Lyon. Dr. René Jankovici, a war-hardened surgeon who saw brutal fighting in the civil war in Chad, has never seen anything like it. It was like a can of sardines that had been opened. It was totally horrific. There were bodies falling out of windows, which were all cut up. You could see decapitated people, amputated people. It wasn't like surgery in wartime. It was much worse. The scale of the disaster quickly becomes apparent. Rescue workers estimate that over a hundred people are trapped in the crushed and twisted train. Colette Pacolet is one of them. The young mother is pinned between two seats in the first carriage. I don't realize that I'm crushed under the metal or that a train has crashed into us. All I am thinking is that I want to get off the train. 7.30 p.m. Many of the passengers have suffered serious injuries in the collision. Medics must act fast. But there's a problem. The crumpled metal of the train prevents rescuers from reaching many of the survivors. Medics can only stand by while the emergency workers use cutting equipment and steam hammers to get through the tangled mass of metal. We could hear the sound of compressors, the exploding of windows caving in under the pressure. We could also hear wailing and people calling for help. <laughs> Finally, the rescue team is able to free Colette from the metal seats trapping her. 11 p.m. Colette is one of the lucky ones. Dozens of others are still trapped under tons of wreckage. Medic Dr. Jangovici and his team make a grim decision. He realizes the only way of freeing the most seriously injured in time is to amputate their trapped limbs. Once on the platform, the full extent of Colette's injuries becomes apparent. Her hip and pelvis are fractured, and she has lost a dangerous amount of blood. Doctors fear she may not make it through the night. The mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac, and the Minister of Transport visit the scene of the crash. The rail operator, SNCF, is a state-owned company. They want answers, and quickly. 12 noon. Now the weary emergency teams are only recovering bodies. The mangled trains are finally torn apart, and the runaway is pulled away for analysis by the accident investigation teams. 56 people are dead, and 57 are injured. In the hospital, Colette's heart stops beating, but doctors manage to resuscitate her. It's three months before she's well enough to go home to her son. Parisians grieve for the people killed in the Gare de Lyon train crash. 
It's the worst rail disaster in the French capital's history. But there is anger, too. France has one of Europe's most sophisticated rail networks. Many safety procedures are in place to prevent an accident like this. How did such a major disaster strike here? The runaway train was a Z-5300. There are up to 140 trains of the same design in use on rail routes into Paris. Since the brakes on Solène's train appear to have failed, could other trains of this type also harbor a dangerous hidden flaw? The next day, the French government appoints a six-man team to conduct a state investigation. Now, by rewinding the events of that fateful day, and by going deep into the investigation, we can reveal what really happened at the Gare de Lyon. Why did the train's brakes fail? Why did no one reroute the train to safety? And why did many passengers on platform two find out too late that a runaway train was heading straight for them? Advanced computer simulation will take us where no camera can, into the heart of the disaster zone. Investigators move the wrecked runaway train to a sidetrack. Three days later, they begin an inch-by-inch -inch examination of the shattered hulk to find out what went wrong with its braking system. Jean-Pierre Pascal is the investigation team's chief technical advisor. He is head of the National Research Laboratory of Transport and an expert on rail braking systems. Pascal is shocked by the scale of the disaster. This accident at Gare de Lyon is important because of the number of victims and the scale of the catastrophe. It was exceptional. It wasn't something that I could have even contemplated. I had never seen anything like it. Pascal knows that over the past seven years, terrorists have been bombing French trains. Have they now found a devastating new way to cause carnage on their French rail network? If so, thousands of innocent travelers could be at risk of attack. Jean-Pierre Pascal is investigating what caused a runaway train to crash at the Gare de Lyon, killing 56 people. His first job is to examine the crashed train. He knows the brakes failed and needs to understand why. As he sifts through the wreckage, he immediately finds something suspicious. It appears a crucial brake valve has been closed. The valve that feeds air down through the train to work the brakes was closed. It should have been open. It's a disturbing discovery. Did someone interfere with the brakes on the runaway train? Investigators must consider a shocking possibility that the runaway train was the victim of a deliberate act of sabotage. The brakes are powered by compressed air generated in the engine carriage. The air is forced down a pipe, which runs the entire length of the eight-carriage train. Each carriage has an individual brake unit that gets air from this pipe. There's a valve on the pipe at the rear of the engine carriage. On the runaway train, the lever controlling this brake valve is shut, preventing air from traveling through the train to power the brakes. Investigators believe there is only one possible conclusion. Someone must have closed the valve. Pascal realizes that whoever did this must have had specialist knowledge of the train's braking system. So he doesn't believe it bears the hallmarks of a terrorist attack. Yet it is clear that the valve has been shut. So who closed it? He questions the train's driver, Daniel Solène, and guard Jean Bovy to see if they can shed any light on the mystery. Solène tells him the brakes were working fine for the first 58 minutes of the journey. They even bring the train to a quick stop when someone pulls the emergency alarm at Vert de Maison. 33 minutes to disaster. The 
the valve must have been closed after this event. Could the person who pulled the emergency cord be involved? No one can explain why she pulled the cord, and she was gone before the guard could question her. The media puts out an appeal to find out who pulled the emergency cord. The day after the crash, Odile Mirois, a 21-year-old single mother, comes forward. Mirois explains that she normally takes this train to Verde de Maison to pick up her children from school. She doesn't know that the new summer timetable means the train no longer stops there. Panicking about not being at school in time, she pulls the emergency cord. It automatically activates the brakes throughout the train. Investigator Jean-Pierre Pascal concludes that her actions are irresponsible, but not suspicious. Now, Pascal probes the guard, Bovy, about what happened after the train was abruptly halted at Verde des Maisons. Guard Bovy tells him that he goes to reset the emergency cord handle, but the handle is stuck. He can't shift it. The reset handle for the emergency brakes is between the first and second carriage. The handle is also very close to the crucial brake valve lever that Pascal discovered had been closed. But neither man recalls anything strange about the lever. The train driver Solan now tries it, but it's stuck. I didn't see exactly what he was doing. We were in a very small space. There are maybe 20 inches between the carriages. After several minutes of sweating, Solen finally shifts the handle, returning the brakes to normal. But when he returns to his cab, the brakes are still locked. Pascal is puzzled. Why didn't the standard resetting procedure unlock the brakes? He scrutinizes the layout of the braking system on the runaway train and discovers something intriguing. If the brake pipe valve is turned to the off position, a safety mechanism kicks in, keeping the brakes locked, even after resetting the emergency cord. It's a fail-safe system to stop a train from going anywhere without pressurized brakes. Pascal had thought someone closed the valve, maybe in an act of sabotage. Now he suspects there may be another explanation. Could Solen have closed it by mistake? He examines his interview with Solen more closely. When we interviewed him, when we asked him questions, he admitted it. He said, I touched that lever to help myself get a good grip. He did it to try and free the handle he thought was stuck. It confirms Pascal's hunch. While trying to reset the emergency cord handle, Solen uses the main brake pipe lever to get more leverage. As he struggles with the emergency cord handle, he inadvertently moves the brake pipe lever without knowing it, closing it. Solen thinks he has simply reset the emergency cord handle. But by closing the brake pipe valve, he has cut off the air supply from the engine that feeds the brakes throughout the train. The brakes in the last seven carriages are now locked in the on position. But if the brakes are left on, how does Solan get the train moving again? The only ways to release the locked brakes are by repressurizing the entire system or by manually unlocking each brake. Standard procedure dictates that Solan should call the engineers who would have detected his terrible mistake. But anxious to get going, Solen ignores the rules and tries to unlock the brakes himself. He doesn't realize that he's moved the brake lever and that the system is locked due to lack of pressure. Instead, he's convinced the brakes are locked because of another common problem. Solen believes there's an airlock in the brake system, which can sometimes happen when the emergency cord is pulled, causing too much pressure around the individual brakes. He thinks that if he can bleed some of it out, the airlock will dissipate and the brakes will unlock. 
Solen works his way along all seven carriages, assisted by Bovi. Mr. Solan purged the brakes until I said it was fine. I'm not really a technician, but I assisted his actions. It works. The brakes are freed. But Solen's actions are catastrophically misjudged. He has not cleared an airlock and reset the brakes to normal. Instead, he has bled away what little air was still left in the system. He's freed the brakes, but also inadvertently overridden one of the fail-safe systems, and with the main brake pipe valve closed, there's no way for new air to come in and replenish the system. With no air left in the system, the train barely has brakes. Pascal and the team have uncovered a horrifying catalog of human error. So Len not only disabled the main system for feeding air into the brakes, he painstakingly disarmed every single brake on the train. 7.02 p.m. Solène finally sets off again for Paris's Gare de Lyon. Anxious to make up time, he accelerates to nearly 70 miles per hour. Now, a 300-ton train with one-eighth of the braking power it needs is heading for Paris's Gare de Lyon. But there's still a chance to stop the train. According to the new summer timetable, there's one more scheduled stop at Maison Alfort, four miles from Gare de Lyon. Maison Alfort is on level ground. Had Solène tried his brakes here, he would have had plenty of time to come to a natural stop, two and a half miles before Paris. Pascal needs to find out why Solène didn't discover his brakes weren't working at Maison Alfort. He questions André Tolens, the duty controller at Gare de Lyon that night. The train is now running 26 minutes late and may throw other trains in the busy timetable off schedule. To make up lost time, to Lance orders Solen not to stop at Maison Alfort and continue direct to Gare de Lyon. Six minutes to disaster. Solen drives straight through the station. The last chance to use his brakes before the hill down into Gare de Lyon is lost. Yet Pascal knows there are still two safety procedures in place to avert catastrophe. There's a backup electric-powered brake in the train. And at Gare de Lyon, station staff could have used the points to divert the runaway to an empty stretch of track. So why did both fail? He turns to the last leg of the runaway train's journey to explore Solène's actions after he discovers his brakes are faulty. Two minutes to disaster. A yellow signal indicates to Solen to start slowing down. His train is just over a mile from Gare de Lyon. Pascal analyzes the onboard tachograph, which records the train's speed. Even with just one working brake, Solen manages to slow the train from 60 to just 28 miles per hour. But then he hits the four degree grade heading down to the station and picks up speed again. Even now, Solen still has one last chance to slow down the runaway train. Investigators know that his train has an auxiliary electric powered brake system. It's designed to slow trains going at high speed to save wear on the brake pads. So why doesn't he use it? Solène reveals that Bovi did go in search of a handbrake in one of the carriages. But Pascal knows that even if he had found it, it would have been useless. The handbrake is only designed to stabilize a stationary train and isn't powerful enough to stop a train at high speed. Yet the auxiliary brakes, which could have effectively slowed the train, are operated from the driver's cab, right under Solène's nose. Pascal discovers that drivers hate the electric brake. They avoid using it because it can cause problems. La conjugaison avec le frein pneumatique 
The combination of air power and electric brakes can often cause jams, locking the wheels. In general, drivers don't use it. So Len was unaccustomed to using the electric brake. And in his panic, he simply forgot it was there. Pascal calculates that if Solen had applied the electric brake in combination with a sole working air brake in the driver's carriage, he could have slowed the train enough to avoid a major collision. Solen's terrible oversight means he loses his last chance to halt the runaway train. But one safety system at the station still remains. Pascal turns to the actions of the station staff. Standard procedure when faced with a runaway train is to identify it and divert it safely to an empty stretch of track. So why didn't this happen? One and a half minutes from collision. Controller Tolens tells Pascal that he hears Solens distress call over the radio. I've got no brakes. I've got no brakes. In any communication with the controller, the driver should give his name and position. Stop everything. I've got no brakes. Stop everything. But in his panic, Solen makes a terrible mistake. He doesn't identify himself. Tolens has no idea which train the distress call came from. And Solen's voice is so distorted with emotion, Tolens doesn't recognize him. If he can't identify the train, he can't divert it. The controller tells investigators that when he tries to contact the mystery driver again, there's no response. Solen must have left his cab. They realize that this episode leaves Tolens in a terrible predicament. All the controller knows is that the runaway train must be one of the four trains bound for the underground platforms. Investigators learn that Tolance and his staff try to call all four drivers. If they can eliminate the three that are not in trouble, they'll be able to identify the runaway train and divert it to an empty stretch of track. But there's a problem. Before Solan left his cab, he hit the general alarm. It sent a high-pitched whistle through all trains on the network, telling drivers to stop until they receive instructions. Drivers start to call Tolance to find out what's going on. And Tolance explains that this barrage of calls prevents him from identifying the runaway in time to divert it. But investigators are about to discover that even at this stage, disaster was not inevitable. On reaching the station, Solen's train was supposed to be routed into platform one, an empty platform. So how did it end up crashing into a packed commuter train? French investigator Jean-Pierre Pascal has discovered that station staff at Gare de Lyon couldn't divert the runaway train away from the packed commuter train because the driver failed to identify himself. But when Pascal explores the final moments before the collision, he makes a startling discovery. Pascal learns that Gare de Lyon's train routing technology allows signalers to program the points in advance. The inbound train's route into the station should have been pre-programmed earlier that day, before the crisis. The runaway train was on track 2S, heading for the commuter train on platform 2. But 561 yards before the station, a set of points on the track were supposed to automatically switch Solen's train offline 2S and into platform 1, which was empty. The runaway train still would have hit the buffers at the end of the track, but Pascal is convinced the crash would have been far less devastating. In my opinion, no one would have been hurt. The train would have been wrecked, but there would have been no injuries. Did the signalers forget to program the points? Pascal finds that there was no oversight. The signalers did their job correctly. So what went wrong? Pascal probes the final moments leading up to the fatal collision. He discovers that when signalers hear the general alarm, regulations demand that they initiate what's called the general closure procedure. All signals turn red stopping all trains from moving anywhere on the lines 
in and out of Gare de Lyon. But the closure procedure has drastic consequences that the signalers could not foresee. It destroys the last chance to avert catastrophe. In order to give the signalers full manual control of the network, it overrides all automatic pre-programming of routes. The points no longer automatically reroute Solens train into an empty platform. Instead, the points lock in their current position. The collision is now unstoppable. It's the final piece of the puzzle. Investigators can now understand the convergence of events that caused the Gare de Lyon train crash. How a runaway train was left speeding toward Paris. Why all the safety mechanisms failed. And how a final twist of fate left hundreds of homeward bound rail passengers seconds from disaster. 33 minutes to disaster. On the Milan to Paris train, a young woman pulls the emergency cord, slamming on the brakes. The emergency cord must be reset to return the brakes to normal before the train can depart. While doing so, driver Solen inadvertently closes the air supply to the brakes, rendering them useless and locked on. 20 minutes to disaster. Solen mistakenly diagnoses an airlock and bleeds air from the brakes to clear it. Seven minutes to go. The inbound train resumes its fateful journey to Gare de Lyon station. But what no one knows is that now it only has a small fraction of its normal braking power. Two minutes to impact. So Lynn tries the brakes, but gets almost no response. He radios the station, but forgets to identify himself or the train. 90 seconds to disaster. Solen hits the emergency alarm, which prompts signalers to override the automatic routing system that would take the runaway train to an empty platform and sets the runaway train on a collision course with a packed commuter train on platform two. Disaster is inevitable. 15 seconds to disaster. Delayed driver Andre Tongui sees the onrushing train and orders his passengers to evacuate. As the train heads straight for him, he stays at his post to repeat the warning. The collision claims 56 lives. Investigators conclude that had it not been for Tongi's brave self-sacrifice, many more would have died. The self-effacing Andre Tongi emerges as the hero of the Gare de Lyon tragedy. Pascal and the investigation team find that the main cause of the Gare de Lyon crash is driver error. But they also highlight several technical and safety shortcomings in the rail system. They find that the brake pipe lever was too easily accessible and vulnerable to sabotage. The radio system was overly complex and drivers needed more training in its use. And they recommend that signalers should be able to close all signals without overriding all pre-programmed routes. Odile Mirois, who pulled the emergency cord, Daniel Solen and controller Tolance all faced criminal charges for their role in the accident. Tolance and Mirois were cleared. Daniel Solen served six months of a four-year prison sentence for manslaughter. Colette Pacolet made a full recovery from her injuries, but she remains angry that the buck stopped with Solène, the runaway train driver. She believes the train company should also take responsibility. My feeling is that the SNCF is at fault. The SNCF as a whole. It's not one person or two people. It's a whole bunch of things that went wrong that day. In the wake of the tragedy, SNCF introduces a slew of new safety measures. It overhauls its driver training program and phases out brake pipe levers. Radio communication on the network is also upgraded. Hard lessons were learned from the tragic events at the Gare de Lyon, and modernization came at a high price. 
But in the wake of the disaster, France now has one of the safest and most technologically advanced rail networks in Europe.